And we're here with David Lepofsky. You know, you're the chair of the AODA um, Alliance. Right. And you have been an outspoken advocate for years when it comes to accessibility. In this well, area. we fought for the accessibility law from 1994 to 2005, and we've been fighting ever since to try to get the government to keep its promises and to effectively implement that law. All right. And the thing is that you would think that by now, when it comes to the bigger structures, the newer ones that we're seeing in the city, that's what we've kind of focused on BT this morning. We focused on the newer structures that have been built, public spaces that mm -hmm. still aren't accessible. Does that shock you that even now, almost 2017, you're running into these issues? It appalls me, but it doesn't shock me. It doesn't shock me because we tried to get the government to enact appropriate standards so this wouldn't happen. They watered everything down, and therefore they're getting the results that we predicted, which is uh, accessibility bungles even in new buildings. And it's just, uh, uh, it's frustrating, but we just are as determined as ever to make sure this changes. What are some of the, the sh more shocking ones to you? Like, for example, we did walk through uh, Women's College Hospital, but you pointed one out that we showed at 7 o'clock this morning on air um, right at the front door. Well, how many front doors have, have you or I or anyone gone into in hotels and hospitals and stores where they just automatically open? The good news is they install an automatic door opener at Women's College Hospital, but the, the ex inexcusable news is that it, it isn't automatic. You don't just walk up and it opens like pretty much every other one I've, I, I run into at a hotel. I don't run into them. I walk through them. Mm -hmm. um, here you've got to wave your hand, and as a blind person, I have no idea where where to wave by hand or that there is something to wave by hand in front of and they're not universal where they put them as well. That's a, that's a barrier for people who've got uh, limitations in their hand movements or who are carrying things uh, or managing uh, other, you know, assisting other people. It, it's just pathetically bad design. And this is at a hospital which is meant to serve people who are sick. People who are coming there aren't at their peak. They're uh, at their most vulnerable. Right. And so we're getting some um, comments online right now, some people just saying good morning to you, David, from Lindsay, from Ottawa. A lot of people um, starting to chime in now. Aviva Rudberg just commented saying that her college isn't fully accessible um, and she's in a brace until at least January, so she's dealing with this um, as well. I've asked what college, so I'll just wait for that response there. Also, Elise King just saying that she agrees with the fact Toronto is still building all these resident, uh, I think, residential environments still not accessible for anyone as they said it is 2016 and still nothing has changed as we were talking to Luke Anderson about real estate mm -hmm. and a lot of these townhouse condos and townhouses that are popping up everywhere but what you're greeted with you know sometimes seven to ten steps and, and, and people have to understand it's not just the physical environment that is full of barriers that's huge and it's a serious problem mm -hmm. but there are lots of other kind of barriers that impede people with vision loss or hearing loss or all sorts of other kind of disabilities but when you mention colleges so we're giving the example, one of the examples this morning of a brand new, or now almost brand new Ryerson uh, Learning Center, but this is a recurring problem at colleges and universities. It's the taxpayer who's footing a lot of those bills. We've called on the Premier to agree to develop an education accessibility standard under the Disabilities Act. That would set rules for ensuring full accessibility uh, at the places we learn, at schools, colleges, and universities. Now, the, the Premier has recently announced that they're considering it, but they've been, they've been looking at it for five years. We say it's time to just say yes, because one of the things that Education Accessibility Standard could do is uh, set standard for the built environment's accessibility in the places where our students learn in Ontario. Right. They shouldn't have to face barriers when heading to school. And, well, and also, each college and each school board and each university shouldn't have to reinvent the accessibility wheel and, as in the case of Ryerson, get it horribly wrong. Now we have some more, um, some issues coming in here, comments um, here. Linda Pattison saying, what I think is crazy is you get to a plaza and it has handy, a handicapped parking space, then a curb to get to the walkway and another curb to get into stores. Like things just don't jive. It's like the one isn't talking to the other. Well, exactly. And this is where, again, the province could solve this by setting the proper accessibility standards and properly enforcing it. And unfortunately, the province meant to do well when it passed our accessibility law 11 years ago, but it's it's fallen down on it. Now, we have a new accessibility minister, Tracy McCharles, uh, and last weekend at a conference, uh, a session, an event that I was also speaking at, she pledged 
that she supports getting us to full accessibility by 2025. Well, that's good news, but we need to see the action. And we encourage people to retweet our tweets on this. If people follow us at, at AODA Alliance or me at, at David Lepofsky, um, they'll see our tweets on this. Two politicians, and all they got to do is click retweet, and they're adding their voices to ours. Right. And speaking of the AODA Alliance, you have also launched this campaign earlier this year uh, with the hashtag AODA fail. Right. So a lot of people are tweeting with that hashtag with a picture showing some of the fails that they've run into when it comes to accessibility. Exactly. We launched this because we think the big weapon in our nonpartisan campaign is the smartphone. If you see an accessibility barrier, whether it's a physical barrier or any other kind of barrier, take a picture of it, use the hashtag AODA fail, and for the benefit of us blind Twitter users, put in some words so we know what's in the picture. We will then retweet it to each member of the legislature who's on, uh, on Twitter, and you can add your voice to ours by retweeting those tweets. Um, and that's that's how we are doing this. With, with, with you don't have to take any time. You just out, you encounter a barrier, take a picture. Now we are talking about some transportation barriers for commuters out there. Um, Sonia Mancini saying that I find it frustrating. The recently renovated GO stations aren't wheelchair accessible, like Bloor GO. While I'm not a, in a wheelchair, I can't do stairs, and therefore I can't use the station. And the thing is that you um, you you were one of the advocates who was behind getting the announcements on subways, the actual stops now. I had to sue the TTC personally, not once but twice, uh, a decade ago to force them to announce something as simple as just announcing all the route stops on the buses and subways, which we now do because of that lawsuit. But transportation accessibility is a huge issue. The uh, government passed the transportation access standard uh, back in 2011, and it helped, but it was unduly influenced by the transit authorities who really wanted to drag their feet. And so we keep seeing accessibility bungles. Um, and unfortunately, with the GO Transit, Metrolinx has been the subject of a lot of problems and concerns. The government is now reviewing that transit standard, and we, but they haven't reached out. Uh, the, the committee that's doing its review hasn't reached out to us to get some grassroots influ uh, input. We're going to give them that input anyway, but one of the areas that we asked them to include in that transit access standard uh, years ago were, again, standards for the built environment to make sure that transit stations are fully accessible. Um, and again, the government didn't listen. Again, the building code amendments weren't adequate. And again, we have these problems over and over. And they're doing it with our tax money, and that's wrong. Um, as, you, as you speak about this, there are more and more um, comments coming in about transit. Burlington Transit, um, again, Lakeshore um, line along Go, Go Transit as well, not being wheelchair accessible. It goes on and on, a lot of people saying this. Um, and here we have Christopher Sutton saying, thanks for this report. We really do need to highlight this critical issue more. My huge frustration is with barrier to the workforce. This is another big one. Today we have so many highly qualified people with disabilities able and ready to work yet can't find employment due to attitude barriers as well. Even large organizations for people with disabilities don't even hire people with disabilities or they have discriminatory practices within. Is this something that you've heard? Oh, well, let me, let me tell you two things. First, mm -hmm. there's this guy named David Onley who used to work mm -hmm. here. He then went on to be our lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. He then, and he has a disability, and then he then went on to be the, the government of Ontario's special advisor on accessibility. This is the guy they want advising them. Well, what's he said about the subject you just mentioned? He has said that the unemployment rate facing people with disabilities in Canada is not only a national crisis, it's a national shame. And that's the government's own special advisor. Now, last weekend, the government's new accessibility minister, Tracy McCharles, credit to her, she, she wants to come forward with an employment strategy, and we'd like to be consulted on that. But we say that you can't get a good job if you can't get a good education. So the absolute first uh, item that's got to be in any government strategy on increasing the employment of people with disabilities is a strong education accessibility standard to tear down the many barriers that our kids with disabilities too often face in Ontario's education system at all levels. And again, we've asked the Premier, she said she'd consider it, but they've been considering it for five years. It's time for the Premier to say yes.
Well, let's talk a little bit about kids with disabilities and the barriers they face mm -hmm. at school because you're working on a project now. I, I'm sure there are parents out there who are watching right now who have a child with mm -hmm. a disability who, you know, is struggling with even just getting in or around school or being with their, their yeah, friends. Absolutely. Well, let me just tell you that, that let me start with the fact that every school board that gets government money, public or Catholic, has to have a, a committee called a Special Education Advisory Committee. I have the privilege of chairing the Special Education Advisory Committee for Canada's largest school board, the Toronto District School Board. We have 46,000 kids with special education needs, different kinds of disabilities and, and gifted kids. Across the province, it's a third of a million kids, okay? And they, that, that's one out of every six kids in publicly funded schools have, have special education needs. Different kinds, some are mobility, some are vision, some are autism, but they face a school system that was designed initially as if they weren't there. It's designed for kids without disabilities. And, and their families have to fight one barrier at a time, one school at a time, or one college or one university at a time. And it's for that reason that we're advocating at the provincial level for an education accessibility standard so that parents don't have to keep fighting these battles one at a time. And so that school boards don't have to reinvent, and colleges and universities don't have to reinvent the accessibility wheel. We're, we're do, the way that Ontario is doing it now is the most expensive, least effective way to get where we want to go. There's a more efficient, less expensive option that's what we're proposing. Now, for those watching this, um, if your uh, children are at TDSB or if they were and they uh, have special education needs, the um, Toronto District School Board Special Education Advisory Committee is doing an online survey right now. If you go to the main TDSB website, tdsb.on.ca, you'll see a link to it. It's on, on, um, it's on SurveyMonkey, and we're very eager to hear your stories and get your feedback about how things are going, whether they're going well or they're not, they could be going better. Tell us about it. We've constructed the survey, and we really want to hear, hear from you. And that's very important because we, we talk about the barriers in the public spaces and so on, but not often, unless you're a parent or a family member of a child with a disability, sometimes that kind of goes by the wayside. You don't think about it. Well, let me give you just one figure. TDSB, our biggest school uh, board in the country, it has 550 schools now. How many of those have wheelchair accessibility? Well, according to TDSB, using their own measure of accessibility, at the start of the year, of this year, the number that had wheelchair accessibility of 550 was only 85. That's crazy. That's crazy. And, and to quote our prime minister, or to borrow his, his language, why is it crazy? Because it's 2016. This is a barrier to parents with disabilities, kids with disabilities, teachers with disabilities. And I'm now only talking about physical access. We also don't have a plan for digital accessibility in the classroom. And, and think about how important computers and tablets and, and apps and stuff are for the way our, our students learn, whether it's in college or university or in school. So this is again where at TDSB we're making recommendations, but province-wide, this is where the government of Ontario could really show strong leadership and, and, and say, let's come up with a plan for the whole province. Let's use the Disabilities Act, it tells us how to do it. The government makes an education accessibility standard with input from us and from the school boards and the colleges and the universities. By the way, I can tell you one thing that's really quite amazing. Who's on side on that one? Well, we reached out to a number of the teachers' organizations, and so far the, the province of Ontario, the government has been told has, that, that they, the following organizations support the call for an education accessibility standard. Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, uh, Association of English Catholic Teachers of Ontario, Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations, mm -hmm. Canadian Union of Public Employees Ontario, folks who are working in the front lines of our education they system, they're saying, they're not saying, oh, don't make us do any more. They're saying, we got to do more. So why isn't it happening? That's well, the question. That, well, uh, we need people watching this show to let their member of the Ontario legislature know, let the premier know, it's time to just say yes. It's time to say we need an education accessibility standard. And I'm hopeful that the premier is going to hear that message and is going to listen and is going to act on it. Well, Teresa Jones just uh, wrote in saying, let's give our politicians and decision makers a day with disabilities. Let's see how they make it through just one day in our province. Let them see what it means to be blind or not able to do 
the stairs as well and maybe that'll be eye-opening it was eye-opening for me to walk through the ho- just the one building with you, well, you know, and I, see re- the problem. I, re- I remember one that you and i did and it was I, i'm not sure you've got a clip of it but but when we went into the uh, women's college hospital and we walked by the machine where you pay your yeah. your parking fee mm-hmm. and you just thought that's fine mm-hmm. and i'm not faulting you mm-hmm. but then i took you out and showed you an accessible parking lot but i came back in and i showed you again the keyboard and the screen and i said how does a person in a wheelchair see the screen it's at standing height yep. So they made a point of designing an accessible parking lot, and that's good. But then they put the electronic kiosk in that's not accessible. And by the way, that violates an accessibility standard that's been on the books for five years, but the government is not doing an effective job of enforcing it. And, and one of the problems is, in this case, it would be enforcing it largely against itself. We really need an independent agency to do this. Do you think that by 2025, that's the the year when Ontario is is aiming to be fully accessible? Do you think that's possible considering we're knocking on 2017? Well, the problem is that we're not on schedule for accessibility, full accessibility by that deadline right now. And and don't take that from me. Take it from the an independent review done by the former dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. Her name is Mayo Moran. And it was done about a year and a half ago at the government's request. So they appointed her, they selected her, they asked for her advice. And she, she showed that we're not on schedule. The problem is they haven't put in, in place a plan to get us on schedule. And when Kathleen Wynne was running for leader of the uh, Liberal Party back in 2012, we asked her for a pledge, and she gave it. She promised that if she became premier, she'd ensure that we are on schedule. So uh, the good news is we got the law in place, we got a, a, and the premiers made the commitment. We just need them to act on it. And, and, and we're, the coalition I serve, we try to be constructive and offer ideas on how to get there. And, and we've done that. It's, it's a question of them acting on it. Now, we have uh, another comment from John McNeil. He says, I live in rural Ontario, and it is the worst area for tourists who are disabled to come to. For example, the busiest grocery store in Perry Sound, and all the handicapped parking is on a steep hill. So try to load your bags even when you're rolling away into traffic. It just doesn't make any sense. This is such a real people story. This is about the story that... And, and everybody out there either has a disability now or will get one later, as long as you grow old enough, because... Getting older is the biggest cause of disability. We're actually the minority of everyone. So any store or restaurant or hospital or university that doesn't design itself for us all is hurting us all, not, not a minority, the minority of everyone. Um, and and that's, that's why in the end, doing accessibility is a moneymaker for business. It's gonna bring in more customers, broader pool of employees. Um, let's see, I'm just checking the time I here. I think we're running out of time. Yeah, you know what, we are. But, but I, can I just invite people watching this, if they want to learn more and get involved, I'm going to give you a website and an email. Go to www.aodaalliance.org. And we send out regular email updates. If you want to learn more about how to get involved, send an email. And all you got to say is sign me up. And here's the email address. It's aodafeedback at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. AODA feedback at gmail.com. All I got to say is sign me up. We'll put you on our update list and we'll give you lots of action tips on how you can help our cause. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for chatting with us here on Facebook Live. Thanks everyone for watching as well. We're going to be chatting with David coming up on the 830 News, so stick around for that as well.